Listen to the story. It may just be a story, but I want to tell you and make sure that you hear this because in the future, what if this is all true? Or maybe the truth is simply what happens in life. I'm shocked to have learned this, the events that unfolded over centuries ago. What I will say ahead of time is because of the sensitivity of this issue, I will try to back up everything I say with facts and time. However, there is no guarantee that what we see here or what they see is a conspiracy or not. So it may just be the best to listen to it as a story. I will also try not to draw any conclusion on this matter, rather use it as a chance for you to do your own reading and research. It is the best for both of us this way. I will tell you this story in chapters. We start with the backstory to all of this. Now, if you hang out in certain areas of the internet, you may inevitably come across a fantastic and unbelievable story. The United States has been covertly controlled by a corporation called United States, or United States for over 100 years. Sounds exciting, but crazy, right? As with most unconfirmed theories, this one still lacks the strong public evidence to justify some of its extraordinary claims. In particular, the best proof we can find today of this corporation called United States or United States appears in pixelated images with questionable making of it. Let's get into this. Listen to it like a story, like I suggested. In 1871, a seditious act was performed by the government. A coup was made to rewrite the Constitution and put we the people in all capitals under a new corporate contract transferring the United States of America into the new Corporation of the United States of America, which transferred the power of we the people and the Constitution over to the new corporation. When they did that, it placed the citizens in the United States as property of the corporation, which was centered in Washington, D.C. This action made Washington, D.C. a foreign entity on American soil of sovereign states. It was established through a loan from the Vatican when D.C. was transferred into a city-state, and this corporate entity then ruled over the people. Now, what took place may have way bigger chain effects. When they did the broker deal to get the loan from the Vatican, they did so via the Bank of London. At the time, they transferred all the property in D.C. Columbia over to the corporate entity of D.C., a foreign corporation. Now, the city of London, that is the square mile within the Greater London area, is not technically part of the Greater London or even England, just as Vatican City is not part of Rome or Italy. Likewise, Washington, D.C. is not part of the United States in that sense. That is, it controls but on paper the world, as they know it, the District of Columbia represents the United States. That's the issue. These sovereign corporate entities have their own laws and their own identities, pretty much, and they also have their own flags. The government of the United States, Canada, and Britain are all subsidiaries of the Crown, as is the Federal Reserve in the U.S. Now, the ruling monarch in England is also the subordinate to the Crown. The global financial and legal system is controlled from the City of London by the Crown. The square mile making up the center of Greater London is the global seat of power in this story, at least at the visible level. Now, the Residence Act of 1780 established the D.C. area as the federal government, and by February 1801, the D.C. Organic Act officially organized the areas around the Potomac River as the District of Columbia. Then Washington, D.C. was established as a city-state in 1871 with the passage of the Act of 1871. This is the strange part. You can't find much on just the Act of 1871, which officially established the United States as a corporation under the rule of Washington, which itself is subvariant to the city of London. Now, on Wikipedia, it reads, The new government consisted of an appointed governor and 11-member council, a locally elected 22-member assembly, and a board of public works charged with modernizing the city. The seal of the District of Columbia features the date 1871, recognizing the year the district's government was incorporated. Now, if I understood this correctly, this is the exact timing that took place to subsequently allow the incorporation of the United States corporations. Now, corporations are run by presidents, which is why we call the person we, that's perceived to hold the highest seat of power in this land the president. Now, but we have been doing this before the corporation, though. So the fact is that president is nothing more than a figurehead for the central bankers and transnational corporations, both of which themselves are controlled by high, very, very high powers in Europe. That really controls this country and ultimately calls the shots. Now, President Donald J. Trump has moved out of 
the DC area permanently for he cannot be pres the president over a sovereign nation in a foreign land, which is what the White House and the Capitol are. President Trump was voted in by we the people and not the corporation. Now, if this is the case, then what means in the near future would be that there is bound to be a new system, almost like a whole new government system. Not by the way it is run now, but by which the, something I don't know, but I think the key to understanding that format may be a type of monarchy, but the ruler is chosen by the wish of the people, who is in turn chosen by the greater powers. Going with this theory, after Donald J. Trump exits, the White House DC should be locked down because it will not be possible for a foreign ruler to rule over a sovereign country. Therefore, the foreign ruler must be locked out from the White House. Now, in this case, that would be this new administration. Now, DC was reportedly seen shutting down the lights of the White House just recently, and it means that no one is there, possibly. So, the United States Corporation's company filed bankruptcy with the Florida Northern District last year. Now, the lawsuit has been filed against United States Corporation Company. The address listed for United States Corporation Company is 1201 Hayes Street, Tallahassee, which is in Florida. But reading that filing, for some reason, this USCC does business with two Chinese companies, or as two Chinese companies. And I don't know how long this has been happening, or how long they've been operating as Chinese companies. So the two companies are Chinese uh, Teletech Holding and China Telecom which are two of the major CCP-controlled companies operating in China. But in different websites with the same tax ID, the corporation has a business address in Wilmington, Delaware. Interestingly, the location is quite close to where Joe Biden lives. Now, the registered agent for a United States corporation company is the pretense Hall Corporation system. Registered agent is a business or individual designated to receive important communication like legal notices or summons and important paperwork sent to the state or sent by the state, sorry, for periodic renewal of the business entity's charter, if that's required. Now, I'm going to spare you all of the details on this whole circle of shell companies and whatnot, but what does this all mean? Well, President Trump ended the corporation of the United States on May 4th of 2020 marking the end of the presidency of the United States Corporation. Which means, if this is all true, Trump would actually be the 19th president of the United States rather than the 45th. We can't really confirm it it's the, if it's the same company as the one I described before, but this does serve some connections. Now let's get into our first chapter, the rise of the Rothschilds. Who are the Rothschilds? Well, the Rothschild's banking family of England was founded in 1798 by Nathan Mayer von Rothschild, who first settled in Manchester, but then moved to London. Nathan was sent there from his home in Frankfurt by his father, Mayer Amschel Rothschild, and wanting his sons to succeed on their own and expand the family business. Mayer Amschel Rothschild had his eldest son remain in Frankfurt, while his four other sons were sent to different European cities to establish a financial institution to invest in business and provide banking services. Now, Nathan Mayer von uh, Rothschild, the third son, first established a textile jobbing business in Manchester, and then from there went on to establish the, uh, uh, I believe called N.M. Rothschild Sons Bank in London. Merchants and banks from England gained massive wealth with the expansion of global conquest by the British Empire. Not only did it gain them power, more importantly, it opened up trade routes and exploitation to another part of the world, Asia and North America. The Hudson's Bay Company, for example, one of the oldest companies in the 1670s, was really developed to aid the foreign trade in Canada and northern U.S. soils. Though they operated businesses in different aspects, bankers were always at the end of the line for money. But in the reverse, how much of Britain's global conquest was actually driven by the ambition of the monarch over the ambition of the merchants? Or was it the other way around? Now, that's up for debate. That is where the Rothschilds sort of stepped in. Following the end of the American Civil War, the cost and the fatigue of the North and the South felt was unbearable. They needed to stabilize, grow, and unite. Now, when the country was weakened and financially depleted in the aftermath of the Civil War, it was a strategic move by foreign interests, like such as international bankers, who were intent upon gaining a stranglehold on America. The congressional body at the time cut a deal with the international bankers, especially with Rothschilds of London, to incur a debt to set bankers. Now, because the bankers were not about to lend money to a floundering nation without serious stipulations, they devised a way to get their foot in the door of the United States. 
According to Donald Watkin, an attorney and business owner on his website, it reads that the history of the Rothschilds starts with 1791. The Rothschild family gained control of America's money supply through Alexander Hamilton. Now, Alexander Hamilton was the first Treasury Secretary. Now, when the family established a central bank in the U.S. named the First Bank of the United States, which received a 20-year charter from Congress in 1791. Now, as the first Secretary of Treasury, Hamilton was the main author of the economic policies of George Washington's administration. He took the lead in the federal government's funding of the state's debt, as well as establishing the nation's first two de facto central banks, the Bank of North America and the First Bank of the United States a system of tariffs as well, and also friendly trade relations with Britain. Mm, that's interesting. His vision included a strong central government led by a vigorous executive branch, a strong commercial economy, government-controlled banks, support for manufacturing, and a strong military, of which now we might see it as a consistency with the rise of socialism and communism ideas. Now, when Congress refused to renew the charter in 1812, the Rothschilds threatened the U.S., with a most disastrous war with Britain. Now, the U.S. stood firm following through on their threat. A second war broke out between the U.S. and Britain. Now, the British war effort was first financed by the Rothschilds. Now, when the war ended in 1815, U.S. finances were again in shambles. By 1816, Congress passed a bill authorizing a second Rothschild-dominated central bank with another 20-year charter, named the Second Bank of America. This bank gave the Rothschilds control of the America money supply again. In 1823, the Rothschilds then took control over the financial operations of the Catholic Church worldwide. And then in 1832, President Andrew Jackson led a successful effort by Congress to retake control of America's money supply from the Rothschilds by refusing to renew the charter for the second bank. Not until 1913 would the Rothschilds be able to set up their third central bank in America. In the meantime, beginning in about 1875, the Rothschilds acting through their New York banking partners such as Jacob Schiff at the banking house of Coombe, Loeb, and CO, financed John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company, Edward Harriman's Royal Road Empire, and Andrew Carnegie's Steel Empire, all of this through Rothschilds' money. Now, the Rothschilds also helped New York financier J.P. Morgan and Drexel's and Biddles of Philadelphia to establish European branches of their respective banks in exchange for allowing the Rothschilds to control the banking industry in New York and therefore America. And in 1913, the Rothschilds established their last and current central bank in America called the Federal Reserve Bank. Now, this independent bank regulates and controls America's money supply and monetary policies, even though the Federal Reserve is overseen by a board of governors appointed by the President of the United States. The bank's seal control still resides with the Rothschilds family. Not even President Donald J. Trump can break the Rothschilds family's financial grip and influence on the Federal Reserve Bank. This is where the story almost becomes unimaginable. The Act of 1871 formed under President Grant formed a corporation called the United States, a corporation owned by foreign interests, moved in and pretty much changed the original Constitution with the Act of 1871. The original Constitution for the United States at 1788 was defaced and in effect vandalized and sabotaged when the title was capitalized with the words for was changed to of in the title of the Constitution of the United States. So now the United States becomes a corporation. That is what the Constitution of an incorporated United States of America that's currently being used. It operates in an economic capacity and has been used to fool the people into thinking that it governs the republic. Now before we go on, if you enjoy the content, make sure to subscribe to the channel and like this video. Also comment below and hit the notification button. I've recently noticed people telling me that their likes are not registering. But before we actually go on to the next topic, we have actually been demonetized by YouTube, which means we can no longer place any ads on the videos because YouTube is trying to tell us to stop releasing our content that tells truth and they want us to follow their agenda. Now, we don't want to cave into the pressure from YouTube. Therefore, we have a donor box link in the description box below if you would like to support us. Now, let's get into the chapter two. And the signing away of the United States, the corporation was formed in 1871 which controls only the District of Columbia and its territories. It purchases or it acquires, such as Puerto Rico, Guam, Virgin Islands. 
Many think that income taxes and some laws do not affect people in the sovereign states of the, un uh, the Union as they are outside of the control or jurisdiction of the United States Corporation. Now, the United States of America is different from the United States Corporation. This comes into the discussion as to why D.C. It might be so eager to become a state. And what if the case it does become a state? And what if it goes bankrupt? What is the chain of effects on that? And does the U.S. Corporation officially end its tie with the United States then? Or that's, those are the questions I can't answer right now. As well, another of Rothschild's doing was involved, obviously, with the Federal Reserve System. And at this point, what I wanted to do was create a centralized financial system that only benefits the U.S. Corporation, not the people. And along with that, the question of why we shifted from gold standard and silver to paper bills, making the U.S. Benjamin pretty much the number one priority in our lives right now. Now, Franklin D. Roosevelt took the nation off of the gold standard back in 1933. And the problem is gold is set, while paper money is not. They did this to allow banks and stock to exist in almost an isolated system that is controlled purely by those who are in power. Think of what happened to Wall Street just now. And who knows, but what actually is true is that JFK tried to bring the American economy uh, back on gold standard. Now what gold standard does is that rather than linking the paper bill to an imaginary value, which is manufactured and created, what it would be like currently now, it would instead link it to gold, which is a, a set and limited object that holds value. Now this means that a certain bill equated to a certain amount of gold. There is a restrictive factor to it. Without it, gold standard, it allows for central bank systems to manage the full, uh, flow of the market. Now, in other words, it allows the government to control money. JFK signed an executive order 11110, which put the silver up to match the price of money. Now, in short, it was an order for the treasury to issue certificates backed by silver bullions, as well as mint silver dollars that would be considered money. Now, these silver certificates took the form of dollars for the most part, and the notes would say that whatever the denomination on the bill was, it would be prepaid in silver to the bearer on demand. And simply put, if you had a dollar, it was worth a dollar of silver. Now that November, President Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas. And thus sparking a lot of the conspiracies that the Federal Reserve had a hand in his death. Now, this hasn't been proven, or I don't know if there's any way to prove it, but in 1964, Treasury Secretary C. Douglas Dillian halted the swap of silver certificates for silver dollars. And on June 24th, 1968, just barely five years after the executive order was announced, swapping for dollars with silver coins ended. And America went right back to the exclusive Federal Reserve System. Whether this was an attempt or not, it did feel like it triggered some type of reaction to the attempt and during the early 1900s, the fear of dictators and warmongers after Hitler and Mussolini sort of created this need for centralization and bug control platforms. Now, the United Nations, International Monetary Funds, World Health Organizations, these global organizations that sort of had this goal of directing the world towards peace, or as they say so, but in reality, can we really see it from the fundamental reason? We might see it as a clear need for centralized financial systems. Maybe this is what I will say. The backlash against Trump leaving the WHO, the United Nations Human Rights Council, the Paris uh, Climate Accord is not without reason. This took us free from a centralized economic system. Well, for the most part. But let's talk about what happens modern day, right? What recently took place with the fight against Wall Street is no coincidence in my opinion. Because what people are doing now is actually they're buying up silver. And they're seeing through the apparent money management system, the one not so closely related to silver or gold. So the question is, did any other presidents know about the corporation? Well, I highly doubt they didn't. But time calls for different entanglements of events in the past. And even now, what is behind the scenes is unspeakable to everyday Americans. This is the real truth. Only the gods above us can really see the deals and uh, what it's in the making. So did JFK die because he was about to kill the corporation? Or maybe did Trump get targeted because he was going to continue JFK's work? What about Reagan, who almost died because maybe of the same reason? Let's go to chapter three. What took place during Trump's era? Maybe this is the answer to the question. Now, we have to relate to what Trump tried to do. Now, he tried to destabilize the swamp. And at this point, you might have realized that the world isn't as the surface represents. Within the depth of the earth, the roots of evil are intertwined from the east to the west coast of the nation then extend beyond the Pacific and the Atlantic, the 
to China in the east and to Europe in the west. This swamp runs so deep to the point where you try to move the Federal Reserve, you trigger the Rothschilds, you trigger all of the internationalism, you trigger all of the globalists, and you move to the rest of the establishment. You trigger a chain of feedback in the forms of constant media backlash, defamation, lies, cheatings, all of that. And what took place this election may have been seemingly a difficult battle of good versus evil, but it may make you feel better to know that this was a very tough fight. And it stems in 200 years of hardcore establishment and corruption. It's beyond human nature and the evil is beyond anything we have witnessed. But at the end of the day, this may just be a story. Maybe another story to justify our truth-seeking desire. Now what history signals is just another chapter that highlights where we are today. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not. That is for you to judge. So that was the end of my story today. Thanks so much for tuning in. Before we go, YouTube has decided to demonetize our channel, which means we no longer place any ads or have any ads on the channel. YouTube says we must change our content policy to reapply for monetization. They're trying to pressure us into following their rules and censor our truth-telling content. Therefore, we would appreciate any support via our donor box link in the description box below. We will continue to work hard to provide you good, but more importantly, truthful content. In any case we disappear from YouTube, you can find us at the following places. We also upload video on to YouMaker, and we also have an email newsletter link for you to sign up to stay updated on the channel. And to stay connected, follow our social media page on Twitter and Telegram. Thanks so much for your continued support and donation to Beyond the Noise. Have a good evening.